Punch water, sir. On Monday, the 31st of January, the Prime Minister said in this place, we have been cutting crime by 14%. And again on Monday, he said, what we are actually doing is cutting crime by 14%. And at the same time, we've been cutting crime by 14%. Speaker, what we're actually doing is cutting crime uh, by 14%. Crime by 14%. 14%. 14%, the ONS found instead a 14% increase. Point of order, Sir Desmond Swain. Madam Deputy Speaker, on the 14th of December, in a debate on the uh, COVID regulations, I said that more people were dying in the carnage on the roads than uh, of COVID-19. <laughs> Notwithstanding the carnage on our roads, certainly killing more people than COVID at the moment, some of us still decide to drive. I've now seen the statistics. That was incorrect. I thought it appropriate to correct the record. Thank you. Following the Foreign Secretary's answer earlier to me about the FCDO's Equalities Impact Assessment conducted in March 2021, I'm seeking your advice, Mr Speaker, on any other way to encourage her to fulfil her duty to this House, as the Ministerial Code states, to be held to account for policies, decisions and actions, to be as open as possible with Parliament and to refuse to provide information only when disclosure would not be in the public interest. The Foreign Secretary has said the government's practice is not to formally publish equalities assessments and adds her view that this would have a chilling effect on the advice prepared by officials. But it is a matter of policy that we don't publicly release equality impact assessments because it has a chilling effect and people can't be honest internally. That is why we don't release them. But this is confusing, Mr Speaker, as a range of equality impact assessments have been published in the past, ah, for example, yes. the Coronavirus Bill. Mm. And no one will be surprised that the former DFID's commissioning of independent reviews of its assessment work in the past, as well as ICAI's also examining such yeah. issues. Yeah. Fundamentally, it is deplorable that the Foreign Secretary used the fact of this assessment to celebrate her department, but will not put the information into the public domain. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're ready for an answer. I think it will be helpful. It's very important that scrutiny committees have access to relevant papers and records to do the job the House has delegated to them. The International Development Committee is best placed to assess what information is needed for its inquiries, and I trust that the Government bench has heard the Honourable Member's concerns and will respond to the Committee's request in a timely manner and provide the papers. In July 2020, the member for Calder Valley told LBC that, and I quote, sections of the community are not taking the pandemic seriously. When asked if he was talking about Muslims, he said, of course. When challenged, he refused to apologise. We now know that just a few weeks earlier, the Prime Minister attended a boozy party in Downing Street and number 10 staffers were wheeling suitcases of drink to work. But I note that the member for Calder Valley hasn't condemned that behaviour as not taking the pandemic seriously. This weekend, a member of the public wrote to the member for Calder Valley, copying me into that email, raising her concerns about his comments. He replied, not apologising for his divisive remarks, but by insulting me instead. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, can you advise me on how to bring the member for Calder Valley to the Chamber to apologise, not just for insulting me, but more importantly, for his offensive slur against British, British Muslims? On a point of order, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to apologise to the House for not declaring my interest when tabling two parliamentary questions last year, one on the 13th of May and one on the 4th of June. I tabled these questions because of my long-standing interest in climate change and as a result of constituency casework. An administrative oversight resulted in a breach of the rules, and for that I am sorry. I have put in place measures to ensure a similar mistake cannot be made again. I wish to put on, on the record my thanks to the Commissioner for her time and care in rectifying this matter. Point, point of order, Alison. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I just wanted to use the opportunity to uh, allow the Chancellor to, ha to hear a clarification. Um, the Chancellor has suggested that the Scottish Government might want to follow the UK Government in eventually introducing a 19% rate of income tax. What I didn't hear was whether the SNP are going to deliver the same income tax cut for Scottish taxpayers that the UK Government is delivering as paid for in these numbers in 2024. 
I, I wondered, Madam Deputy Speaker, if it would be possible to have the Chancellor correct the record, because there is already a 19% rate of income tax for the lowest earners in Scotland. So, in fact, it's the UK government that has to play catch up with the Scottish government. <laughs>